To tell you the truth, as I was preparing for the message, it was about uh, Thursday afternoon, and somebody mentioned to me about uh, Thanksgiving, and I went, Thanksgiving? I thought Thanksgiving was next weekend. <laughs> And so, uh, so the end of my week and, and yesterday and this morning has been a little bit, uh, my mind fraught, worrying about how unthanksgiving of a message this is. And, and, uh, and so I was asking the Lord just as, as I was preparing this morning, Lord, Lord is, is there something to be thankful for? Is there, a, is there a Thanksgiving theme that we can weave through this message um, just to kind of redeem it a little bit? <laughs> And whoops. <clears throat> so, and, and the Holy Spirit actually spoke quite clearly to me. And uh, we, of course, have been in 1 Corinthians, and we've been learning a lot about this church and a lot about this time frame, and we're going to deal with another one of these passages. The text is 1 Corinthians 14, uh, about verse 20 and through to the end of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up there. But, but one of the things about Corinth that just amazes me, and, and I c- couldn't help but think of this over and over, Lord, I am so glad I am not the pastor of the church of Corinth. (laughs) Like, thank God that they were a mess. And I don't know if you're like me, but I have have an amount of patience for people. How many of you have a measure of patience for people? And how many of you know that that measure of patience comes to an end at a certain point? And then you're just done, that you just have nothing left. This church would have done that to me, I think, in almost no time flat. And so, so as I was thinking about this, I thought, what, what resilience on the part of Paul to stay in the trenches and fight for this church? They, they really knew how to get it wrong. They really knew how to screw it up. If there was a way to screw it up, they could find it. They really did. And... Uh, and he has to be quite firm with them, but I'm just thinking, I'm so thankful for fathers and mothers in the faith that don't give up on people. Aren't you? Paul, that's the way Paul was. He was like, he even says to them, you, you know, you have many teachers, but how many fathers do you have? You know, and of course, he planted this church. And as, as we look at all the stuff he's dealing with, I'm, I'm thankful this morning that God doesn't give up on the church. God has never given up on his church. We are still plan A and plan only for this world. The body of Christ, the people who know Jesus, are God's plan for redeeming this world and for bringing life into it. And so I'm just amazed this morning as we go through this and and that God, I'm so thankful that God has never given up on anybody. If you're one of those anybodies, and if the enemy's ever told you that God has given up on you or that you're past redemption, I want you to know this morning it's a lie. If he didn't give up on Corinth, he can handle anything else. He can handle the rest of us. All right? So let's bow and pray, and we're going to just jump into it. Heavenly Father, this morning, I am so grateful for your grace, for the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in our families, in our churches. We thank you, Lord, that we can give you praise for the things you have done. You have a, a spectacular track record of loving your people But Lord, we also thank you this morning, as Amanda pointed out, we can thank you for those things which are yet to come. And so this morning, God, I pray that you would speak to us yet again through the power of your Spirit. And Lord, I pray that we'd be able to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And uh, and we are so grateful today on this day for you and for your work among us. In Jesus' name, if that's your prayer, you can say amen. Amen. So, so Corinth, whether it was its glorious Greek beginnings, it was, it was a, a capital of, of the empire, then it became a pile of rubble for 100 years, it was, a, it was nothing, and now it was the New Testament days of the Roman rebuild, as we've talked about, and one thing never changed. In all of those various iterations of this, of this city, one thing never changed in Corinth, and that was that life and culture was interlaced with self-centered religious and spiritual practices. And there was something really interesting about the way people practiced religion back in that day. This was an extremely carnal city of diversity, of class, of religion, of race, of wealth, of, of social standing. But all of their lives had one thing in common. They were all tied to the gods. 
How many of you have watched movies about the old times, about these kind of periods and times? And, and, and there's all this talk about the gods, the gods, and making sacrifice to the gods. And, and that was just a normal way of life for these folks. Everything was tied to the worship of their gods. And one of the manifestations, besides the temples and idol worship, was a widespread custom of invoking a deity of one of these pagan religions to grant a curse against your adversaries. This was just the way business was done. And there was four main areas of life where you could go to one of the temples and, and have whatever deity of your choice pronounce a curse or curse the life of a person. It was rivalry in sports was number one. How about that? How's that for interesting? I think somebody's cursed the Edmonton Oilers. I, that's the only explanation. They're, they're just terrible. Number two, not surprisingly, was relationships and, and issues of love and, and relationships. Number three was in politics, people who had different political opinions or people who were in power, and especially and including in litigation, if, if things were in the courts, and there was all kinds of cursing going on for there. And the other one was in, in commerce. It was to be able to curse somebody else's business so that your business would thrive and surpass theirs. And so it was just normal. And, and so what, what level of life do those four issues kind of leave out? Like there's almost nothing else. What, what else could you find to curse? Uh, and, and, and this was normal. So, so if, if you wanted somebody's position, you'd go to the temple and get a curse over Dennis, and then you could become the next elder at CFA because Dennis somehow lost his mind or whatever happened. I don't know what happened to Dennis, but... But, you know, the, the gods went to work on him, and that poor guy, he's just useless now, and so we got rid of him. And now there's an opening. Oh, lucky for you. And imagine that in business. Imagine that in the issues of the heart. Thousands of examples of this have been unearthed uh, in, in archaeology, and, and they find these tablets where curses are actually written in tablets, and then they were buried in the temple, buried in the dirt, and there are just thousands, thousands of examples. And you would think that, uh, that the Corinthian Christians and the Christians of that generation would have avoided that because they would understand that that wasn't the right way to go about living life, but that wasn't the case. This stuff was so deeply entrenched, they didn't even think twice about it. In fact, when they would come to know God, the Lord Jesus would become the most powerful God. They understood who he was, and so they would use his name to curse people. Because after all, you can't get anybody bigger than your God, than, than Jesus, to curse somebody. So, I mean, if you got Jesus on your side, you can, like, wipe out all the competition, no problem. How many of you guys think that sounds like a good idea? How many of you are actually thinking of somebody right now <laughs> that, that this might be exactly what you needed? In their minds, in the ancient Near East, the gods controlled everything. They controlled every aspect of life. Remember that, that people were created to do the handiwork, to do the work for the gods. That was what most people thought, uh, not people who followed Christ um, or who believed in Jehovah, but that was what the religions of the world had taught them. And so... This is a very interesting paradigm to think about and its impact in the world and its impact even on the people of God. So I want you to just remember this. Do you remember when Jesus went to go to a, a small community and, and a village and he wasn't received and his disciples' reply or response was, God, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Do you remember that? Isn't that an interesting framework for how the world operated in their minds, for why they would say something so stupid. And Jesus' answer to them is very interesting. You don't know what spirit you are of. And I want you to keep that answer in mind. You don't know what spirit you're of. You don't know the God you serve if you think that he would do that and you think he would be honored by you asking him to do that. You need to figure out who God really is. And so Jesus would teach us, don't hate your enemy, don't curse him. Love him and pray for him. And these folks would just go like, what? What? There are enemies. This is how we do life. Jesus said, no, it's not how you do life anymore. I want you to pray for them. I want you to love them. If your enemy takes your coat, I want you 
to give him your cloak also. If he forces you to walk a mile, I want you to walk with him a second mile voluntarily. Can you hear how contrary Jesus' teaching is to the way most of the people of their, that world thought? See, if, if you say that, that you should bless people and not curse them, today people go, yeah. That's not what they did. That's not what they thought. They went, what? And so, so all of this, why talk about this? Because besides their casual approach to sexual sin in the Corinthian church and their immaturity, which expressed itself as their selfishness, as their competitiveness, as of, uh, uh, they were title conscious, they were divisive, they would say, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, and they would divide themselves all up and fight amongst each other. All of this, they would bring these cultish, worldly practices into, the, into their spiritual experience into their walk with God. And Paul, of course, was not going to let that fly. Paul's remedy was to teach them how the kingdom of God works, to teach them who God really is, that God is not a God who curses, but a God who blesses, and that life and maturity is really defined by your maturity is defined. Listen, your spiritual maturity is defined by your desire to bless and build up other people. That's who is mature. The one who is willing to pour their lives into others and not use their position for themselves. That is what we call in the Christian vernacular having a servant heart. What did Jesus teach? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, do what? Learn to be the servant of everyone. Don't grasp for power the way the Gentiles do, the way the Corinthians did but learn to serve. But God loves this church. He loves this church, and he has no intention of seeding hard-won gains, people who have come to know Jesus, of giving them back or letting them operate in this old satanic way. And so Paul had no problem measuring these people by their behavior. He calls out their immaturity and divisions in chapter 3. He calls out sexual sin in chapter 5, fighting in the courts and sexual sin again in chapter 6. Uh, he rejects casual divorces in and out of covenant relationships in chapter 7. And he enforces mutual marriage rights. In chapter 8, he calls them out that they are using their freedom in a way that's actually causing damage to other people. They're causing their brethren to stumble. And they don't seem to care very much. In 9, he appeals for them to learn to sacrifice for the sake of the kingdom. Sacrifice your own well-being for others so that they can be taken care of or, 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 or be helped, even if, at that, even if that costs you something. And so he appeals to them to act like Christ. And then he moves into several spiritual things. And this is the section we're in where he's correcting their use of spiritual gifts because they've gone way off the track here. They, uh, in, in chapter 10, Paul talks about how toxic it is to combine a faith in Christ with other idols, with idolatry, that that's just a recipe for disaster. And he uses Israel as the example, how they, God would save them and, and set them free, and then they'd walk into idolatry again, and they'd get wiped out by another person. And, then, and this cycle, and you know throughout the Old Testament, they just went through that cycle over and over and over. And the Babylonian captivity was the one that finally, finally they came back to God and they stopped following other idols but, uh, but they, they went through such pain. And so Paul is using this as an example. And why does he tell them that? Because exactly what they're doing. They are mixing their faith in Christ with their idols, with their old practices, and it's creating tremendous chaos in the church. And there's competition and division all over. So this recurring Pauline theme we find in chapter 10, let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. And this is a thing that Paul will say over and over and over. He is measuring their maturity by their willingness to serve one another. The bottom line is this, whether it's Corinth or in Grand Prairie, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what? Common good. What's that? That's for the good of everybody. Not for my personal gain, but for all of our gain. And so if there's something where I get ahead but it doesn't help, I put that aside. But if there's something where we can all get ahead, that's the direction we want to go. 
So one of the many challenges in Corinth is actually their use of spiritual gifts. And one of the gifts that they love the most is the gift of tongues. Being spiritual for them or being the evidence of the fullness of the Spirit for them, they believed had to do with speaking in the languages of angels. And it is an amazing thing when God gives us this gift. For them, it, it was kind of a merit badge. It proved that they were already walking in the things of the Spirit. And so they, the, the, tongues was their favorite gift. But the way they did it still reflected the old temple worships that they came out of. It was cultic. It was selfish. And the thing that Paul addresses the most is that it was chaotic. It was just chaos in their services. Paul will make one point. It will be obvious to us, and he will repeat it over and over again just to make sure we get it. And that's where we get into the passage today. So the purpose of the gifts in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 19, um, in the beginning of this chapter, he's laying this out. Verse 5 says, now prefer prophecy over tongues. Why? Because if you speak in a tongue, you edify yourself. But if you prophesy, the whole church is edified. So, and we're going to see this theme coming through this whole passage. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. Seek the spiritual gifts. Why? So that the church can be edified. So who's this about? The whole church. The whole church being built up. Jesus building his church. 1 Corinthians 14, 13. Therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Now, we're going to just break this one down for a second. Uh, what is the advantage of, if you're going to speak in tongues, why should it be interpreted? So that everybody else can understand, right? And that's obvious. But there's something else in this passage. How many of you notice, how many of you in your Bibles have, have the, the, the male pronoun he in that verse? In mine it does. It says, therefore let the one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. That may lead us to believe that it should be a he who is speaking tongues and interpreting. However, there's a single digit Greek word. And it's kind, of a, it's kind of a fuzzy pronoun. It doesn't really mean he. It doesn't really mean she. It simply means the one I was referring to before. And so here's a good translation of this verse. Wherefore, and in the interlinear, here it is actually. Wherefore, which speaks tongue, intercede in order to expound. In other words... The translators did a good job when they said one who speaks in a tongue. One could be anybody. But then when they added he, they put in a word that actually isn't there because it's this indefinite article. So if you translate it one the first time, you should translate it one again. So let the one who speaks in a tongue pray so they can interpret it so that the body can be edified. Right? All right. So Paul starts in 1 Corinthians 14 distinguishing between personal spiritual connection to God through a prayer language called tongues and this has tremendous benefit and is of great help to the individual believer. It says that it builds you up in your spirit. And then he talks about the shared spiritual connection that they have through the gift of prophecy wherein during public services everyone benefits from hearing what God has to say. So in this church, there was a cacophony of tongue speaking that may have been part of what Paul is addressing in the, in the chaos of the Corinthian church when they were, uh, when they were worshiping. And, and they were selfish, and they were competitive, and, and they were spiritually proud, and they were showing off with their tongue speaking. <laughs> kind of look at me, I'm speaking tongues, I'm so full of the Spirit, look at me. That never happens, does it? You ever met anyone like that? Would you like to see all my spiritual gifts? I can show you my resume of how spiritual I am. You ever met anybody like that? I have. I have. Where are we? Oh. And so Paul is going to deal with actual behaviors, and he's dealing with what's actually going on here now in the church. What is Paul's purpose? Paul has an overriding purpose. In 1 Corinthians 14, 16 and 17, he says... Otherwise, speaking now of this, everybody speaking in tongues with no interpreters, otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying? 
for you are giving thanks well enough. The problem isn't with praying in tongues, but the other person not being edified. In 1 Corinthians 14, 19, it says, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind. Why? So that I can instruct others. So that I can pass something of value, of understanding to the people who are with me in the service. Rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. In a public service, Paul says, I would rather you prophesy so everyone is built up. There's an ongoing issue here of immaturity. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet be evil, uh, yet in evil be infants. But in your thinking, be mature. So he says, you're acting like a bunch of children. Paul's litmus test was this. People in public services are going to join you and they're going to say one of two things as they engage with you in the service. The first one is, if everyone's speaking tongues and there's no understanding and it's just a racket, they're going to say, you guys are crazy. You're all mad. Or... If the gifts are used appropriately and there's an order to it, then people will be convicted and they will hear the word of the Lord and the secrets of their heart will be revealed. And when that happens, they will say, God is truly among you. So what's it going to be, church? When the world comes in and meets with you in the public service where you are worshiping in my name, are they going to say, you guys are all crazy? Or are they going to say, surely God is among you? And this is the choice that he's giving them. And this is his goal. His purpose is to make sure that God is seen as being among them. So we come to 1 Corinthians 14, 23 to 26. Here is our text. Each one, by the way, everyone say each one. Are there any exceptions? Who is each one? Each one of who? Each one of the members of the body of Christ, everyone in the church, each one who is born again has a psalm or a teaching, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. And again, here we have his main point. Let everything be done for edification. Paul's concern is clearly the presence of God manifesting in the services. In the end of verse 26, it's the beginning of an oratory pattern that is going to help us understand what he says in the last half of the chapter. So would you just do this? Just re reach your hands out like this. You are a living chiasm. I thought you might not know what that word meant because I didn't know what it meant. A chiasm is a pattern. So if you start with a hand and then you follow it up, you come to an elbow and then you come to the shoulder and then you come to the head and then this chiasm is a mirror image it repeats and goes back down it's so think about climbing a mountain to the top and then going back down the other side right so hand elbow shoulder head shoulder elbow hand this is this is a, a structure that now in those days if someone was doing a teaching if, if you wanted to read through my notes i could make a copy of it but in those days, you couldn't get a copy of the pastor's notes. And so they had ways of communicating that people understood that were very clear to make sure that the point is clear, to illustrate it correctly, and then to make sure the point was super clear again. In a chiasm, in this one, Paul states his purpose at the beginning, and then he states it in the middle, and then he states it at the end. It's the beginning, the top, and the bottom. He sandwiches everything he's got to say with his main point. And his main point is clear as can be. On the way up, Paul is going to address a certain group of people we're going to call the anything goes camp. I actually think this is probably mostly the Gentile believers who had come from all these various religions and all the chaos that they were used to, and basically anything went for them. Anything was an expression, because after all, they often would attend the temples of many gods, and so yeah, well, the more the merrier, bring it all in, no problem. And then there was another group, but when they did this, they were bringing in their cult worship. There was another group, and he deals with them on the way down on the right-hand side, or whatever, the other side of the chiasm. And this is the people who react against the chaos. And their reaction is to shut it all down. So there is anything goes camp. 
in this church, and there's the nothing is allowed camp. In order just to have control, we're going to shut all this stuff down, and we're going to have nice orderly service. And my guess is that that was probably the Jewish mindset. You know, the Jews came from a very structured form of worship. They were used to it, and they liked it, and they did not like the chaos that the Gentiles brought into the church. And so, as we look at this then, in our passage, we start from verse 26. Paul places his main point in the beginning of this chiasm, let all things be done for edification. And then in the middle, in verse 33, he says it again, for God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. Can you see that in verse 33? And then when he comes to the end of the argument, at the end of the chapter in verse 40, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. Can you see the beginning and the middle and the end? He's got one main point. Now he's going to illustrate it in three different ways. The question is, how should they be acting? How should they create order? Well, the first people, the first group of people he speaks to are those who are speaking in tongues in verse 28. So this is step one of the first part of the chiasm. This is for the anything goes camp. He says, if you're all speaking in tongues, if, there, if you have a tongues message and there is no interpreter, that person should be silent. Hold your peace. In other words, shut up. There are times when the best thing to do in the church is just be quiet. And sometimes we need to be quiet in order to keep order. What's important to note here is that Paul is telling those who are speaking tongues, silence yourselves. Everyone say that. Silence yourself. Regulate yourself. All right? The second one, on the second step of the chiasm, he speaks to the prophets, because the prophets are creating some chaos too. In verse 30, if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the one who is speaking should sit down and shut up. Give way. Give over. Let, let the flow of the Spirit come through the whole body. It's not all through you. You don't have to talk for 25 minutes. I do, but that's different. <laughs> if anyone wants to come and take over, Chris, you coming? Chris is halfway out of his seat. He'd love to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes. So what does he say to the prophets? Silence yourself. Everyone say it. Silence yourself. And then he speaks to women. He speaks to at least a group of women and he says in verse 34, the women are to keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to subject themselves. So we're going to dig into this. How many of you are a little like worried about what this actually means? Not worried? Okay, that's good. But I want to make this note again. Who does Paul say should silence them? Silence yourselves. And in this passage, it actually says that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. When the Holy Spirit is moving through us, He doesn't compel us to misbehave. He doesn't compel us to act out of order. He doesn't compel us to act chaotically. God is a God of order. He does things decently and in order, right? So the goal, the Holy Spirit will lead the body of Christ in a decent and in an orderly way, and the church will be edified. The result, outsiders will acknowledge what? What's His main goal? It's clear that God is among you. The Spirit of God is moving among you, and God is speaking to you. That's an awesome thing. So let's read the text, okay? Follow along your Bible. We we'll begin reading in verse 27, this first step of this chiasm on the left side. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret. If there is no interpreter, be quiet in the church and speak in your heart, in your mind, and to God. Keep it to yourself. Let it be between you and God. Verse 29, he speaks to the prophets. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, then the first one must silence themselves. For you can all prophesy. Who can prophesy? All of you. Who is he speaking to? The church of Corinth. All the church of Corinth can prophesy. One by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirit of the prophet are subject to the prophet. So no runaways and don't blame God. 
Don't blame God when you misbehaved, all right, or didn't silence yourself. And then here's the head of the chiasm, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then the third, on the left side, the women are to keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak. We're going to jump into that in a minute. And then we're going to go down the other side. So this side, he's addressing those who would limit, who would cut out all of this stuff. Verse 35, if they desire to learn, the women, if they want to learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Was it? And then I think this is actually just a little insert where Paul's addressing all three groups, the tongue speakers, the prophets, and the women. Was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? Can you hear Paul's attitude a little bit? He's saying something here. If anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, and by the way, he is not in there, it's if anyone thinks they're prophetic or spiritual, they should recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, and again, not he, but the one who doesn't recognize this will be uh, not recognized, and we'll talk about that in a moment. And now, the second uh, step down on the... Nothing is allowed. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. You can't dispense with the gift. And also, do not forbid speaking in tongues. So you can't cut this stuff out just because it's awkward and difficult. All things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. So there's our passage. A couple of important notes. Uh, First of all, uh, to the women in the interlinear uh, uh, in verse 36, or from you the word of went, or from you did it only arrive? I don't think that's only to the women. I think it's to all the, the three groups that he's already addressed. He's basically saying, hey, when you get rolling and somebody else starts, you should stop because the world does not revolve around you and what you have to say. If the Holy Spirit is speaking, he can speak through the whole body and the whole church. So he's just putting a stop to that. Verse 37, there are no male pronouns. It's not he, he, he. It's actually the person. It always refers back to the the speaker of tongues, the speaker of prophecy, or the women who are speaking in the particular way that they're speaking. And then in verse 38, this is kind of a weird verse, so I just thought I'd throw this in. If any be ignorant, this word in Greek means mistaken in error or not grasping or realizing the truth. That's why they use the word if you don't recognize this. If, If you're not grasping the truth of what I'm saying... Basically, he says, if, if you're ignorant of what I'm saying, then you'll just be ignorant. You, you won't get it. But if you're spiritual, you'll recognize what I'm telling you is God's way of doing things. That's what he's saying to them. Okay, I think we can grasp the counsel on tongues and prophecy. How many of you can see the sense of it? Otherwise, it's just chaos, right? Everybody's speaking and whatever, whatever. Uh, I remember actually Mike Bickle years and years ago talking about uh, a morning in his church where, where two prophets began to prophesy and, and they began interrupting each other. And he said it was like two prize bulls fighting in the middle of a ring. And one would speak and then the other one would jump up and go, and thus saith the Lord. And, and, God, and he called it the morning of the dueling prophets. He said it was so embarrassing. And he said, you could see it wasn't the Lord. And it actually still happens, doesn't it? People get caught up in their gifting. And and sometimes we resume with our gifting. We want people to see that God is with us. And, you know, anyway, anyway, you you get it. But what we're going to do is we're going to focus on verse 34 and 35 because this is the one that opens the door to the most interesting um, theologies. So how should we understand this, this verse? What is Paul talking about? Well, we have a few options, and we're going to cover them just each one at a time, because you may have heard all of these versions of what these two verses mean. Uh, It could, you could say that Paul means exactly what he says, that all women should be quiet in the church and should not speak, period. Uh, Basically, literal to the max. We would have to argue with that position on the grounds of what Paul has already taught. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul has already told women that when they're praying and when they're prophesying, they should have their heads covered, right? Well, that means Paul is telling women that you can pray in the church and you can prophesy. And by the way, if you're prophesying, you are one of the prophetic people who will pass judgments on the other prophecies to make sure and we test all things and hold fast to that which is good. 
This city church also has Chloe and Priscilla and Phoebe. You remember those women that we met in the New Testament that Paul was using in leadership of the church? So according to the letters and Paul's practice and to his counsel previously in this letter, whatever he means, it cannot be a full literal sense that women are not allowed to speak in churches. That much we know. So we're going to have to look for a different explanation of what he actually means here. The second option is that Paul is quoting the nothing allowed camp, and he's saying, basically, you say, quote, women should be silent in the church, end quote. The only problem is is that he doesn't actually say that he's quoting anybody here, and if you remember in the book of Romans where he's trying to make a point, and orators would do this, they would kind of have a pretend uh, person debating them and sort of have that state their argument, and then answer it. So remember where he says, shall we then sin that grace may abound? And then and then he answers his own question. What does he say? May it never be, right? So if he was using that form of literature, that form of oratory, he probably would have done as he did in Romans. But he, it doesn't seem to. Number one, he doesn't say he's quoting anybody. And number two, he doesn't, he doesn't correct it. And so, so I don't think it's number two. The third option is that they had segregated services. So the men were on one side, the women were on the other or whatever, and they were talking back and forth to try to understand what was going on. It was creating noise in the congregation. It'd be like if you were all carrying on conversations simultaneously to me preaching. I know some of you are, you're just using this. But that notwithstanding, at least it's not interrupting anybody who doesn't want to hear it. Uh, but the reality is, is that when they've excavated the churches, there's no evidence that the churches were actually built with separate seating areas, and there's zero evidence that women occupied one part and men occupied another. So there's really, we don't really know that that, we do know that segregated surfaces, uh, services happened much later in church history, where they began to separate men and women, but as far as we know, it wasn't happening here yet. In fact, this church seems like with men and women prophesying and praying together, they were actually serving together. And so, so I don't think that that's a strong uh, solution for this. The next one is, maybe it's that women aren't allowed to use the gifts. Maybe it's, maybe it's not that they, they can talk, but they shouldn't be, uh, they shouldn't be prophesying or, or flowing in, the, in, these, in these gifts, especially if they are words that have authority. Well, we already have 1 Corinthians 11, 5, where we do know the women were praying and prophesying, so I don't think that that's a good solution either. Another option was, They should be quiet when testing prophecies because what if their husband was one of the givers of the prophecy? Then you would have a woman passing judgment with authority over her husband. And so that can't be it. Can you hear how the argument is actually built out of the perception? You can't do that. You have to make the point and then try to prove it in a different way. You can't use your point to prove your point. And so this one doesn't particularly work. And plus, we have again that all of the prophets in verse 29, it says, all you prophets, you should all be judging the words together. So if women are prophesying, they're judging. And Paul makes no gender distinction whatsoever here. And so, so it does, just doesn't seem like a strong explanation. And the final uh, theory is, is if he meant not uh, that women just simply shouldn't teach, which is a kind of speech. The problem with this one is that Paul isn't even talking about teaching here at all. So that would be introducing something into the text from somewhere else, and, and that's not what he's doing here. So where does, this le- where does this leave us? The one thing we do hear Paul say is, if women have questions, what should they do? Ask your husband at home. That's, th- that's what's in this text. It's not their teaching that's the problem. It's their learning. <laughs> it's how they're learning. It's how they're trying to learn. And so in verse 35, he says, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands, for it's improper for a woman to speak. Now, I'm going to say that speak is a very general word. So am I speaking right now? Yes. How am I speaking? There's two different ways I'm speaking. I'm speaking in the sense that I'm communicating with my mouth and you're hearing words. I'm speaking. I'm also the speaker. I'm speaking. 
we mean preaching. But speaking covers it. I'm, I'm speaking. And right now I'm speaking also. Can you hear me? What would you call it if you were? You might call this a different word than speaking. You might call it whispering. Or I could do this one. I've always wanted to do a fire and brimstone one. You're all going to hell. No, I don't know. I'm not particularly good at that. My voice would not last more than about five sentences. Now, that's a different, that, was I speaking? Yes. What would you call it? Yelling. Yeah. And, and how about these other words? Bragging, begging, arguing. Are those all speaking? So, so the word speak here is just the general word for speak. And I think if we're going to understand what kind of speaking was the problem, we just have to dig into the text a little bit more and see what we can learn. And there are some cultural hints for us as well that we know are facts from history. And so in this patriarchal culture, it was considered unseemly for women to speak out in public meetings. It was unusual. So the fact that it was happening when women were ministering in prophecy or in prayer in the, in the church was a, a bit of an oddity. Furthermore, we do have to acknowledge that, remember, this is a man's world. This was a man's world. They had every opportunity. They had every privilege. And many times, women didn't have the kind of educational background and training that many of the men would have received, especially in the Jewish culture. The young males would go and, and go through all of their training and learning and so on, and the women didn't. In fact, there was a Jewish rabbi who's actually quoted, writing from the same time period, it would be better to burn a copy of the Torah than to give it to a woman. And so, so th this is just the mindset. I'm just, I'm just saying that's what they said. We, we know this uh, from, from reading in history. And so it's really clear that women, and especially many in the church, because the church often reached the lower classes, the, the distraught, those who were without hope, those who were desperate. The church often found them first. And so there would be real class disparity, even though there were some rich people who did provide homes for the church in, in their houses. But it, would, it was going to take some time to close the educational gap. That, that's just a reality. They, there was going to have to be some teaching and learning. And so the public meetings were not a place to be doing that. Because if, if, if we preached every message, how many of you think this would be a great message for a first-time believer who just gave their heart to Jesus this morning? They're going to be going, I have no idea what all this stuff is about. But guess what? We have places where we can catch you up. And, and, and we don't bring everything to the lowest common denominator of understanding. There are places where we can learn and grow. There are groups that you can be involved in in the church. And so there was places, and there was a place that Paul was telling them for this. Here's a little cultural etiquette. It's really interesting. Uh, we learn from period writings about the relationship between teachers and students and the interaction when, for example, in the book of Acts where Paul goes and he goes to the gates of the city where, where the people were sitting around and talking about philosophy and all those sorts of things. There was a pattern uh, and there was an accepted way of doing that. And so listen to this quote. If a sage enters a discussion... It is rude to ask him for an opinion immediately, not until he had settled in and entered the flow and the context of the conversation. In other words, it's not fair to jump the guy. He hasn't heard everything you've been talking about yet. And let's face it, the context of the conversation changes what you might say. It changes what your perception is of where somebody's trying to take it and whether you agree with it or not. Now, likewise... Again, back to the quote, a student would never speak until they had come and sat down and settled in and listened for a while. So it would be just rude to, for somebody to walk in and go, well, what's this text mean? And we, okay, well, we've been kind of on this, like, I don't know, was it 14 sermon series, you know? Well, what is your opinion? Can women lead in churches or not? Well, okay, there's a whole bunch of conversation. We're not going to go back. All of you, most of you have been here for most of that. And so we're not going to stop everything and go back to the beginning because you just happened to walk into the interesting conversation. And so this is the point, right? And so there was decorum. 
It was bad form to ask questions that one could easily learn from their own study. When Russell was little, he would ask questions. And he could figure out the answer if he wanted to, but it was just easier to get the answer if he just asked. And so I started saying, if you ask me a question that I know you should know the answer to or you can figure out yourself, I'm going to start charging you 25 cents. And that was, that was our deal. Fortunately, he's fairly frugal. And I said, do you want me to answer that? It's going to cost you? He goes, no, I could probably figure it out. <laughs> right? And so th this was actually, this was kind of the way it was. If, if you could learn something easily on your own, don't make everybody listen to something that is obvious information that's available to all of you. Because number one, it proves that you're not doing any study on your own. It proves that you don't have any motivation. And number two, again, you're holding the whole group hostage to what you don't know. Formal and public events were conducted with decorum and social awareness of our place, of the teacher, of, the, of your place as a student. And it seems like everybody kind of understood these things except for in the Corinthian church where they couldn't seem to get this stuff together. And so Paul is clear and his tone is kind of direct when he asks the question. Here's where we get back to this thing where he's kind of got a little edge and a little tone. Can you hear this? Was it from you the word of God first? Uh, was it from you that the word of God first went forth? Or has it come to you only? What's he talking about here? What's he pointing his finger at? You come into these public settings and you want everything to revolve around you. And it doesn't. There are places for these things. Maybe just ask, where could I get information about that? Maybe be willing to do some study. The church can't revolve around any one of us. This was not the place for uneducated opinions, elementary inquiries, or disorderly discussions. The congregation should not be held hostage to the novice spiritual disciples. Remember, all the chaos causers got the same advice. Whether it was tongue speakers or prophetic people or these women, hold your peace for the sake of order and the edification of the whole body. It was distracting. What they were doing was distracting. It was irritating and perhaps even offensive in that particular culture. So Paul is saying, remember, in most secular environments, women are, are, are not allowed to speak in public meetings, but here they were. So he's imploring them, women, don't abuse the privilege of being allowed to be involved by making it chaotic because you feel the freedom to shout out whatever question you have. This passage is really not a great proof text for either side of the conversation about women in ministry. I want to say that right kind of up front. The Christian ideal does not remove the common ancient idea that a wife should be submissive to her husband. Are you guys okay with that? The, the, the New Testament church doesn't remove that concept. Here's what the New Testament does. The New Testament invites and, and commands the husband to enter into the same kind of mutual submission that the wives have known in that culture all along. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Men weren't used to being told those kinds of things. They were used to having the world revolve around them. It surprisingly adds that we should have the same kind of humble spirit as our wives do, men. And we're all supposed to join Jesus in this. Consider Philippians chapter 2. What does Paul teach the Philippian church? Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if you're going to lay claim to being spiritually mature at all, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. <coughs> Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with what? Humility of mind and regard for one another. Everyone say humility of mind. Regard for others. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who are we following here? We are, want to be with him, 
so that we can be like him. And this is what he's like. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, took on the form of a bondservant, and made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That is self-sacrifice. That is what Paul is appealing for. He's appealing for us to lay down our rights and our demands and learn how to live together in decency, in order, and, and how to get the education. He's, he's got a solution for this. Spiritual legalism, fear, the desire to control because things can, can become convoluted and hard to manage in, in, when the Spirit of God... How many of you are, have sort of a secret backdoor fear that if the Holy Spirit takes over you, what he might have you do and that you won't be in control of that. Go ahead. How many of you have that fear? If I let the Holy Spirit do whatever he wants and I promise I'll say whatever he tells me, I'm not sure I'm willing to give up my veto power. Who's got that? Put your hand up nice and high. Listen, and we're a Pentecostal church and we're scared of what the Holy Spirit might do, right? So, so do you blame them for wanting to kind of rein this stuff in a bit? I don't think we should. I don't think we should judge them too harshly. But keep this in mind. Fear and control and legalism, trying to rein everything in and make it just right so nobody ever makes a mistake and no one ever crosses a line. And This whole church needed was crossing lines and they all needed correction. And God loved them and Paul loved them enough to give it. Do you think you and I can replicate that in our church? That if somebody crosses a line, we'll love them enough and care for them enough to correct them and to have a conversation with them and say, hey, like, what was that all about? You know, <laughs> can I kind of have a, have a little bit of powwow with you here? <laughs> and maybe we could talk about that. And what was in your mind? What was in your heart? Okay, so here's a few things maybe for you to think about. Here's a few scriptures, and, and we can do that in a loving way. But, but chaos doesn't help anybody. The very system that arranged for Jesus' crucifixion was based on a sincere belief that those who arranged his murder were following God's word delivered by Moses. They were the most conscientious, as much as they understood, they were doing it right and they were on God's side. And I would want to say that when we deal with passages like this, you're going to talk to people who have varying opinions and I want to make sure that you speak to them in an appropriate way we all think we're doing it God's way we're all trying to but we don't all arrive at the same place at the same time and agree on everything just yet but for all of us who tend to think that we've got it right remember that Jesus charged the Pharisees with this sobering statement in Matthew 15. He said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. We turn our opinions and our thoughts into doctrines and theologies and when we do that, we're in danger of saying something God didn't say. And it's just as bad to put words in God's mouth as it is to ignore the ones that he says. I don't see any distinction between them. So we may not like what a text says. We may not like what a text doesn't say. We may wish that it said it more clearly, but adding to God's intentions is as bad as ignoring them. And the truth, if we have it, will defend itself and will, it'll shake itself out. Let's remind ourselves. In John 16, Jesus said, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will speak not on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Spirit of God has to lead us into an, a revelation and an understanding of what God's saying and what he means by it. And so to this end, 
We don't seek to attack or defend theological positions or opinions. Our goal is to be spirit-led and be biblical. Would you agree? We want to find the leading of the Spirit. We want Him to lead us to it and to be biblical. Paul's primary calling as apostle to the Gentiles was to make disciples, to preach and reach the lost with the gospel. The culture of the ancient Near East is not the culture of the modern world. But we are also reminded that God inspired these texts and He did so in a way that would be instructive to all people in all times. Romans 15 says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance... What was that word? Perseverance? That means work. We're working at it. We're working at it. Perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we can have hope that we are hearing from God and walking in His ways. You know, at the end of chapter 11, after that other passage on women in ministry, Paul immediately deals with the dysfunction that's happening at the Lord's table. Do you remember that? He says, you, you, you eat and drink, bringing judgment on yourselves the way you're doing it. It wasn't that they were eating the Lord's table, the communion meal, that was the problem. It was how they were doing it. How they were eating. They were creating disunity and, and, and uh, dissension. His solution for that, do you remember what it was? If you're that hungry, eat at home. And it's interesting how this passage, following this passage again, it's not that women are prophesying or speaking because we know that they were. It's how the women were speaking that he has a problem with. And specifically, we know that it was how they were asking questions, that it was creating chaos, and so Paul's solution is really simple and really straightforward. It's not that their learning was a problem. It was how they were trying to learn that was a problem. And to that he says, I want you to quiet yourselves. And I want you to... Now imagine this. Remember this Jewish traditions were not kind to women. But neither Paul nor Jesus agreed with them, with the rabbis. Paul doesn't say women aren't worth teaching or incapable of learning, which I've actually heard some people preach. 1 Corinthians 11, 11 says, However, in the Lord neither is woman independent of man nor is man independent of woman. And in 1 Corinthians 7, he writes, The woman who is unmarried and the virgin is concerned about the things of the Lord. He's saying her heart is towards ministry, is towards kingdom. That she may be holy both in body and spirit, but the one who is married is concerned about the things of the world that she may please her husband. This is one of the most progressive acknowledgments that that a preacher makes in this day. He is saying that this single unmarried woman has a heart towards the things of God and ministry and that she should be encouraged in it, that she should have the opportunity to learn. And in the home, the husband and wife will have spiritual discussions and discourse together about the things of God. Does that sound like something... An apostle might say, I want you to go home and talk about these things. Be Berean, receive them eagerly, but then go home and study and discuss whether these things are so, whether you agree with them. What implications does that truth have for me, for us? Are we doing it right? We have something in our church here called faith at home. That's what we hope you do with every message. I'm not so foolish as to think you spend the rest of the day talking about my sermon, especially on Thanksgiving weekend, but... I hope that you do spend time discussing these things together as couples and as families. That sounds like a beautiful picture to me. The point is clearly preserving church order and by extension the common good, not scandalizing the culture that they were trying to reach. If one is off offending the very culture you were trying to reach, then you're defeating your own purpose. Being culturally aware and limiting yourself is neither being religious nor hypocritical. It's simply understanding that whatever allows a person to come in and say, okay, there's nothing inappropriate going on here, and then they hear God speak to their heart, that's good for kingdom business. And that's, I think, exactly what Paul was interested and wanted them to experience. Between the anything goes camp and the nothing is permitted camp, we find Paul's wise solution to problematic chaos being cultivated in the Corinthian church. Those with limited biblical knowledge 
will not set the pace for learning for the whole church. Private instruction will quickly help them to catch up. The short-term solution, women, stop interrupting. The long-term solution, husbands, take responsibility to bring your wife up to speed in all the things that you know about God so that she can fully participate in the life of the church. Short-term solution, stop the chaos. Long-term solution, close the educational gap so she could be a full participant in the kingdom. One of the things I'm thankful for this morning is verse 26 where Paul lays this out for us so perfectly. Could we adopt this among ourselves? What is the outcome then, brothers and sisters, when we assemble each one, everyone say, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Let's build one another up in the most holy faith. May God give us humility and grace to follow His Spirit-inspired teaching. Can I ask you, are you doing that? When you come to church, are you prepared to let the Lord move through you, speak through you, to connect with people, to encourage others, to somehow be a part of the edification of the body of Christ? Do you have your gift? Uh, Pastor Steve and Kim preached about this. Do you know your gifting? Do you know your calling? And do you, are you willing to bring that and invest it into the kingdom of God? This was the church Paul was trying to create in Corinth. I'm so thankful for so many things today. I love the word of God. I, I love studying it. I, I love the deeper you dig, the cooler it gets. I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit that's at work in us. I'm so thankful that God showed me one day my need of Jesus as my Savior. I'm so thankful, and, and it's taken me like 30 years to, to be able to say this. I'm so thankful he called me to be a pastor. I don't know that I've ever said that out loud before. I'm actually thankful for it. Why? Because it gives my life meaning and purpose to be a part of this community, for us to speak into each other's lives. Is there anything more important than investing in that which is eternal? I was talking to a young man. His, his dad was a pastor and a and, uh, really fine young man. And, and, uh, and I said, and he's not doing it anymore. And I said, does your dad miss it? And he goes, yeah, he does. And so he's done different things. He's worked in different jobs or whatever. And, uh, and then he said this, but there's nothing that quite has, and I'm paraphrasing, but there's nothing that quite has the sense of purpose that he had when he was working as a pastor. Do you live your life with a sense of purpose that you know why you're here in this world? Today I am so thankful that God has given us all a purpose and a reason for being in this world, and it's to know Jesus and to bring those who don't to him. Can you be thankful for that this morning? You're on one end of that or the other. <laughs> Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning for your goodness. I want to thank you for your truth. I want to thank you for your people who have a hunger for the word of God. Lord, I want to thank you for our church body. I want to thank you for the city you've called us to. And I pray, Lord, that we would beautifully reflect you and that if there's anyone who ever comes in to visit us, that they would be able to say this as they go. The presence of God is here. Surely God is among you. Lord, we thank you that you're among us. I ask you to bless each home and each family on this special weekend. Give them wonderful times of fellowship together as we gather around Thanksgiving tables. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.